I, I followed this axiom that it's a lot more efficacious. That means it's a lot more effective. And it's actually a lot simpler to act your way into a new way of thinking than it is to think your way into a new way of acting. Welcome back to Mind Matters, everyone. It is a new year, our first show of the year, and today we are pleased to be joined by Dr. George Simon, Jr. George is the author of several books. We've got some of them here. Um, the first one we read here is In Sheep's Clothing, Understanding and Dealing with Manipulative People, and then following that one, this one, um, I was very happy when it came out. It was a book I Wanted to read and then loved reading. Character Disturbance, the Phenomenon of Our Age. And then a third one, The Judas Syndrome, Why Good People Do Awful Things. Um, I guess I should say, this one came out in 2013. Your first book, George, came out originally in 95, 96. Is that correct? 96. 96. Believe 96. Yeah. And then you've written two books since then. Um, we'll talk a, a, a bit about them, but first, before we get into that, I just want to welcome you to the show, George. It's a, it's a pleasure to meet you, and we're looking forward to talking to you. Thank you, Harrison. Happy to be here. Great. Maybe to start out with, could you tell us about uh, the two books that we haven't read that we don't have here? So what's the last book that you, uh, the, the last book you had published and the one that you're working on right now? Okay. Uh, the last one published was How Did We End Up Here? Um, my co-author, Dr. Kathy Armistead, was my editor for The Judas Syndrome. Hmm. And she said, uh, if you do not write a book about how people get into these crazy relationships and uh, what they can do to make sure that that doesn't happen again and how they can rebuild their lives, then I'm going to write it for you. Hmm. <laughs> and so... <laughs> Uh, we, we had a cooperative venture to write that book. Um, and uh, then she also partnered with me in the writing of my current book, which uh, has been retitled. The initial title was The Ten Commandments of Character. It's, a, it's an expansion on the principles that I outline beginning on page 140 of my book, Character Disturbance. And ever since that book came out, I've, I've gotten thousands of emails from people all over the world asking me to expound on those things more. Mm. And uh, so uh, we did fashion a book called The Ten Commandments of Character that did expound on that, but it didn't bring into, uh, it didn't take into consideration, I thought, adequately enough all aspects of personal growth, including spiritual growth. Hmm. So I have been rewriting it uh, for the last two years, and I'm really on fire lately, especially hmm. because of recent events, I, yes. because I think it's so urgent um, that uh, I, I think we're getting there now, and, and it hopefully won't be long before the newly titled uh, Essentials for the Journey embracing and living the Ten Commandments of Character uh, comes out in print. And I'll be happy to let you know when that happens. Great. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Well, you said yeah. something about um, how did we end up, how did we end up here that, that leads me to one of the questions I wanted to ask you because um, you talk, so I, I'm, I'm assuming that that book is about um, or primarily about relationships, difficult relationships, and basically that what couples say, or what uh, a couple might say after years of conflict is how did we end up here? Maybe divorce or um, some kind of, um, you know, some extreme relationship conflict that leads to a situation where it just seems like there's nowhere to go. Um, and uh, maybe most, mo mostly it's how did somebody I thought okay. was the be all and end all and hung the moon. How did somebody like that turn out to be such a schmuck? <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, so that, that leads me to the question. I was, I was curious um, if you could tell us a bit about your practice and how, how your actual clinical work led to you learning about and kind of becoming an expert on, on these types of relationships and these types of individuals, character-disturbed individuals, people with um, extreme, like, uh, 
uh, personality disorders, and basically just a bit about that background and how that helped you navigate this strange world that a lot of people aren't aware of. Yeah. Well, you asked a really great question. And I say in the opening lines of uh, my new book uh, that will be coming out, that I've had the, uh, the most unusual career, actually the career of a lifetime, because I've gotten to do two things that normally don't go together. I've, I've gotten, I've had the privilege of helping individuals who um, have survived toxic relationships uh, rebuild their lives and, um, uh, and grow and uh, help ensure that they don't fall into similar traps again and become more empowered. So that's been really edifying work. But I've also had the chance to work with people who really needed to be better people. And at some point in their life, they, they actually came to that conclusion. Um, but that kind of work, and this is the important part, because there's a lot of people who think that you can't unbake a cake and that it's, there's just no hope for people with character impairments. The biggest problem when somebody finally gets a clue that they really need to do some changing. Mm -hmm. The biggest problem is that traditional methods of helping them don't work. Mm -hmm. They're not meant to work. So very few folks have the tools to help folks who actually want to be better people. Uh, and so I had to do a whole heck of a lot of clinical research. And then I was blessed with some incredible opportunities, including consulting to uh, juvenile detention centers and programs and prisons, all kinds of places. Hmm. Um, I developed worksheets and I would hand them out to people who had the most uh, egregiously disturbed character. And they would read these worksheets and they'd say, oh my goodness, this is me. This is what I do. How do I change this? Is there another way? I think there must be, but I haven't a clue. And all of a sudden, I realized that there was actually a way to work with and reach some of these folks, too. Now, true, there are some folks who are so seriously uh, disturbed that they exceed our present abilities to help. Mm -hmm. But the, the biggest problem has to do with the fact that most folks aren't trained in the methods that work. So I've had a very uncommon career, uh, helping two different groups of people in two very, very different ways. Mm -hmm. Well, I get the impression from, from the books that I have read that a lot of the cases that you, that you must have experienced have been with types that didn't realize there was, there was a need for any change, it didn't, didn't want to change, and basically had zero kind of self-insight. So right. how, would you, how would you fit that into 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 that aspect of your career like what was it what was it like let's say dealing with a couple you know so with someone one-on-one -on -one like this or or how did it affect you kind of in general with like with uh dealing with that many people who didn't want to change or didn't realize that there was anything or didn't didn't accept that there was anything to change about themselves uh boy you, uh, once again your question is so so good uh Matter of fact, nobody's really asked it of me that mm. way before. Uh, I'm afraid it would take us about three programs to answer that <laughs> properly. <laughs> but um, let me see if I can condense it a little bit. You know, we're taught as, as uh, helping professionals early on that the basis of any uh, helping relationship is unequivocal trust. And what I found, what 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 just kind of happened, you know, I just uh, I can't had an epiphany of my own, is that I've been taught all of these things about why people do things, uh, and I found that when it came to character impaired people, none of those things that I were taught, none of those axioms held. Uh, I was taught, for example, for one thing, that they really don't know what they're doing, that they're mm -hmm. motivated by unconscious fears and insecurities, so they don't really know what they're doing. And your job is to help them see. 
Well, in my workshops, I tell the clinicians, you know, we think they don't see. That's not the problem is they see just fine. The problem is they see but disagree. They aren't, there isn't a thing you can't tell them that they haven't heard a thousand times before. Mm -hmm. They've gotten all kinds of feedback from, from maybe hundreds of sources. Mm -hmm. But they've developed a way of doing things, and it seems to work. So why should they change it? Mm -hmm. um, so once you, <coughs> once you get a different head about you as a helping professional, and once you dare to lovingly confront uh, unhealthy interpersonal behavior, which has to show itself in the interaction between the, the impaired character and the counselor. It has to show itself. Once you confront that lovingly and directly in the present moment and invite change, the whole ball game changes. Hmm. Everything changes. It's, it's the beginning of doing not as you're used to doing but doing a little differently and learning in the process there's an old axiom that uh, that i have come to appreciate the wisdom of because you know i mentioned in my books that i operate within the cognitive behavioral paradigm and basically for in a layperson's parlance that means that what we think and how we think and our attitudes influence <clears throat> what we do so if i'm if i think that a uh, if I'm a man in a relationship and I think that a woman is inherently inferior and is meant to be dominated, then I'm going to treat her in a particular way. Mm -hmm. So what clinicians usually do is we work on the kind of cognitive side of things, getting people to change their mind in the hope that it will change their behavior. Well, it doesn't work that way. What works is changing the behavior because it will change your mind. Mm. So uh, I, I followed this axiom that it's a lot more efficacious. That means it's a lot more effective. And it's actually a lot simpler to act your way into a new way of thinking than it is to think your way into a new way of acting. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I long ago stopped reasoning with people. <laughs> <laughs> And just invited them to do di differently. And then when they did, started reinforcing them very heavily for so doing. Hmm. And after a while, it gets catchy. Well, th that's so interesting because <clears throat> your approach, George, is counterintuitive. And, uh, and, it, and as you say, it works. Hmm. And I can remember reading Character Disturbance, and um, you present this kind of spectrum of of behaviors and from healthy to maladjusted and to character disturbed. And what was interesting for me is in recognizing certain things I have done in my life and, and behaviors and, and actually getting uh, a little shocked um, because of a, you know, seeing certain things on uh, described by you as on this spectrum of character disturbed. So I would say that, um, you know, I'd like to think of myself as a, a relatively uh, healthy, aspiring, healthy individual. They all do. Yes, <laughs> especially me. <laughs> but uh, it's, it is really a very uh, practical, I think, a, a approach to looking at behavior uh, and action and thought processes uh, for the person who is relatively uh, well-adjusted, I think. So, so these books... Uh, aren't only helping one to recognize uh, this framework of, of character disturbance and narcissism in others, uh, but it's this kind of simultaneous work on the self by, by seeing how it exists in oneself. And I, I did just want to say this as well. Um, on YouTube right now, if, if anyone has is, is noticed, there is a plethora of uh, YouTubers speaking out on this very subject, George. And, yes. and I would dare say that uh, this movement to understanding narcissism uh, and character disturbed people is in no small part due to your work. Uh, Wolf in Sheep's Clothing has been around for 25 years, as we said at the top of the show. This is a 
a hugely influential book. So I uh, just wanted to uh, tip, a, tip my hat a little bit more to you here because um, the, the frameworks that you've created uh, for people to, uh, to recognize interpersonally and within themselves um, those traits that, that could and, and should be worked on uh, has provided well, me, a whole movement, I think. Yeah, let me respond to that uh, because I, I, real, I, I, I sincerely appreciate uh, your kind words. And I have to tell you, something compelled me to write that book. When I was in school, I tried my hand at writing and my professors told me that basically it was not my calling. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I never even, I never even dreamt that I would do it. But I was compelled uh, and for two reasons. One is I had uncovered something in my work with aggrieved relationship partners in toxic relationships especially with manipulative partners. Uh, I had uncovered something that we now call the gaslighting effect. We didn't have a name for it then, mm -hmm. but it's that crazy making feeling when you just know that there's something not quite right about what just happened, but the person who's doing whatever they're doing has got you thinking that you're just crazy for thinking it. Um, and I kept seeing this over and over and over again. And I thought, this is, this is a phenomenon. It's a real phenomenon. And if all the people that I'm dealing with are experiencing it, there must be hundreds of others out there who are experiencing the same thing. So even after 20 some years, I still get hundreds of emails from all over the world from people who will say that just those opening words in the book where I say, you know, you're not crazy. Mm. You know, maybe you need to trust your gut. Uh, there are people who are just like you think. Um, and uh, just those words changed everything. So I was compelled to do that by something. I, I, I'm not going to try to define that something. <laughs> I, you know, you can call it whatever you want to call it. But there's something bigger than all of us. And it kicked me in the butt and said, you do this. Hmm. And uh, it was a labor. It was a labor of love. But because I'd not done it before and because I didn't trust myself to do it, um, because I'd been told that I couldn't, <laughs> hmm. um, I just had to do it anyway. And, the, you know, the rest is history. Well, and it was originally like a, an independent publication. Right? Right. Was it self-published or? or um, yeah, uh, I, I, I created a small company. I, I had gone to New York and I dealt with a big company. And we thought that the original manuscript was going to get really big preemptive offers. You know, that, you know, I, I was just. I was young, naive. <laughs> I, I didn't know what was happening. You know, they were talking these hundreds of thousands of dollars in advances and all this kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. I was in way over my head. But the, as, as it turned out, it was a time in the market that was horribly slow. And uh, basically, the feedback I got was the book had had a lot of substance, but it's not what would sell at the time. So it was going to have to be rewritten into some kind of snazzy, jazzy, uh, I, I don't know even how to describe it, but it was not going to be the book of substance that I wanted to write. And I really, my, my wife and I, we just thought about it for the longest time. And I finally said no. And um, I wrote the book that I wanted to write and uh, independently published it. Well, it didn't take long uh, for me to find out that I'd done the right thing. And so when the time came for me to go with a royalty publisher, I was able to cut a really good deal um, and to get the benefits uh, of, of uh, a, a house behind me. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, then I wrote a, 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 an updated edition in 2010. 
But only Road Less Traveled has even come close by Scott Beck. Uh, that's the only one that's come close to the, uh, the durability of in sheep's clothing. Mm -hmm. It still sells more every year than it did the year before. Wow. After, wow. You know, after 20 some years. <laughs> you know. That's amazing. And yeah. so Ilan talked about the, the just how widespread a lot of these discussions are now. And I was listening to um, part of an, inter an, an interview you did last year um, where the lady interviewing you had said that, uh, was talking about, well, the two of you were talking about the responses to the things that you say, like in, in lectures or or, um, or things of that sort and how, how starting out, you'd get a lot of blank stares, you know, right. back in the 90s or maybe even before that, but that, uh, but that nowadays you, you, when you lay out some of these concepts that, you know, the eyes will go wide and people will start nodding like they, like they recognize it and, right, and right. kind of see it. So it, it's almost seems like, um, um, well, it would be hard to, it would be hard to gauge necessarily how much that is your book influencing the kind of the zeitgeist and the, the, the mind of the, of the masses and how much, how much, how much the, 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 well, I don't know. Well, what, what do you think that is? How, how come you think that people are more receptive nowadays? Do you think it's because of your book? Yeah. Or? Well, well, you know, it's so interesting. And that's why I think it's so important that whatever that something is out there, whatever that bigger something out, uh, is out there, that we pay attention to it mm -hmm. and, uh, and listen to it. Because when I was first giving these workshops, it wasn't just that people were looking at me blankly. I did grand rounds at one of the medical institutions just here in town where people walked out. Hmm. I was trying to say that character mattered at a time when the medical profession was thinking of throwing the part of our official book, the DSM, they were thinking about throwing the whole personality section out hmm. because they, the, the thinking of the time was that it doesn't really exist. They were all just our biochemistry. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we could just find the right uh, uh, brain rebalancing chemical, we could fix everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that was the zeitgeist of the time. So it wasn't just that folks were looking at me blankly. They thought this guy is just, <laughs> <laughs> he's ancient. Uh, he hasn't got a clue. Uh -huh. um, and so things have really changed. You know, I, I don't know how you... I don't know how you could process the events of yesterday, mm -hmm. which literally had me crying, mm -hmm. which, which had broke my heart. Uh, I don't know how you could discount the paramount of a, importance of character. Mm -hmm. You know, even some folks who have huge disagreements with and who I think are very misguided in their, their, uh, ways to solve some of our uh, social problems eventually had to stand up and say, you know what, there are certain values here that are being absolutely trampled upon and, and we can't stand for it anymore. Well, that's what character is all about. Mm -hmm. And so I think what we're witnessing is that people are fine. I, I, it, the only thing that it doesn't really surprise me, and may, maybe I could explain more about that later, but that we had to sink to such depths mm -hmm. to appreciate the fact of how, how much character matters. Mm -hmm. That's very sad to me, but I do understand it. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the thoughts I have on that is that on the one hand there, well, there seems there's this rise in awareness or at least a rise in of interest. And I think part of that is a recognition of what's going on because when something becomes so prevalent, um, it becomes more obvious so I think a lot of people looking around the world um, at at pretty much every aspect of life and every every aspect of politics will see something there. Um, and on the one, so on the one hand, that seems like a good thing that there's a bit more awareness of what's going on. But the I'd say that the negative is well, the reason for that awareness is the prevalence of the character disturbance in the first place, which must be like at epidemic levels in order to 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 give rise to that awareness. So. Um, and that's, oh, I mean, oh, oh my goodness. Now you, you haven't had time just yet, probably to read the blog post that I posted today. No, I haven't. 
Okay, well, that's exactly what I was talking about. Oh, wow. Well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I was talking about. All right. I posted a... Uh... Well, okay, well, I'll make sure to check it out after we do the, <laughs> after we do the interview. <laughs> well, yeah, I... you know, we, we've become desensitized. Yeah. Because the most insidious thing about this character pandemic is that most of the forms of narcissism out there are not as banal and not as egregious and not as horrified. Um, and so we give it a pass. We're so used to it. We barely mm -hmm. notice it anymore. There's so much egocentricity out there. There's so much uh, lack of awareness and concern of our inherent interconnectedness. The fact that everything we do impacts something or someone else uh, and that we're all in this together there, there's such a lack of awareness of that it's so deeply built within the fabric of our culture uh, that um, until something gets really seriously awry we don't even pay attention to it mm -hmm. and earlier on I was I was just I was scratching my head I thought okay how bad does it have to get what does a person have to say or what does a person have to do for what used to repulse us to begin to repulse us? Mm -hmm. And the answers that I came up with were, were not pretty. Mm -hmm. They were not pretty. One of the answers, I, I know we don't want to get political, but one of the answers that I came up with is that when people don't feel heard, when people don't feel uh, acknowledged, regardless of where they might be or how we might look at them in their own personal development, they will, um, they will support anyone or anything that they think gives them greater presence and recognition. Uh, and they will dismiss other things that are important because of that, because it's so important to them, mm -hmm. including the importance of character. And by the way, including the importance of their own character mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> in the process. Um, and I think that's where we are, sadly. I, I belong to several different organizations, all trying to bridge the gap and make peace. and I. I can tell you that in every one of those organizations, there's still for me a very big uh, missing piece because, um, because a lot of folks come to the table with the idea that their side has an answer mm -hmm. and that the purpose of the meeting is to get the other side to appreciate the wisdom of their answer. Mm -hmm as opposed to both sides be standing in awe of something much bigger and then humbly working toward a loftier goal. Mm -hmm. We've lost that sense. And that's what, that's the spiritual component of character that was missing from the first draft of my more recent, soon to be published book. And that's why it's meant so much to me to get it right. It's mm. not going to be out there until it's right. And mm. it's getting closer now, but it's not quite right just yet. Good. Well, George, so that uh, article on your website that you just put out is called Narcissism Desensitization Impairs Recognition. Right. And um, I had a chance to read it uh, earlier, and I thought, yeah, if you, if you can't recognize, if you're desensitized mm -hmm. to to the, uh, the signs, uh, to the framework, to the uh, identification of, of character disturbed behavior, uh, then you become, you're, you're swimming in it. It becomes ubiquitous. It's, it's, it's something that is undifferentiated from anything else. Right. And um, so you've been writing about this for quite a while. Yeah. And, and, and you've noticed that we've come to a kind of um, uh, tipping point. Yeah. It, it would seem. So uh, on the show, we've talked about um, social uh, contagion, uh, ideologically possessed individuals, 
uh, we've, we've tried to come at this problem from as many different angles as we could. What, I mean, these problems have always been with us yes. uh, for, from the dawn of time, but sure. what, what do you think has been exacerbating, if anything, what, what is it about Western culture in particular that's made, made it so rife for the, 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 the pestilence, the boil to come to the surface this way and become so putrid and, and uh, toxic? Yeah. Uh, okay. From a practical standpoint, from a practical standpoint, uh, demographics. We were a very, very different country. And you can all, when you look at the electoral map, you can always see these differences um, glaringly uh, in the polarization. We were a different co uh, country when we were a much more rural uh, uh, frontier country. Now, I'm not touting that as good necessarily. I'm just saying we were very different. Uh, there were negatives. I mean, we've had plenty of times in our past that rightfully should make us all quite ashamed. So I'm not saying, boy, all we need is the grand old good old days. That's not what I'm saying. But one of the things that we lost in the process, despite this age of so-called connectivity, is that we lost our sense of community. And how that happened is because our first experience with community is with family. And when families become too dysfunctional, the inmates take over. This is just natural, normal, and it's actually healthy. You know, when you can't trust the people who are supposed to take care of you, you have to learn to take care of yourself. The problem is, as a skull full of mush, you don't know how to do that. We used to have people guiding us that we could trust. When your father is not there and your mother is strung out on drugs and can't even attend to you, you haven't got a prayer. It's nobody's fault, but it's everybody's dilemma. And we can no longer just let it be everybody's individual situation to figure out for themselves. We are all in this together. We are inherently a family. We are a dysfunctional family for sure, but we're inherently a family. But we don't have the family experience and grounding to tell us how to tend to and live with our individual differences and how to help guide those folks uh, along who are struggling. Uh, starting with making sure that we're in a position ourselves in our, within our own character development to actually facilitate that process. So I think the good news in all of this is it is, it, it's the same thing that happens on an individual level when somebody finally decides to change. Sometimes that great something out there is merciful enough to us to let everything come crashing down around us. Mm -hmm. And then we have one of two choices, mm -hmm. change or perish. Mm -hmm. That happens in an individual's life too. Mm -hmm many times. And so it saddens me that we had to come to this point, but what I hope will be the diamonds in the pothole. Uh, that's, a, that's an old axiom too, that uh, mistakes are like diamonds in a pothole. You know, the, the pothole can wreck some damage, but uh, there are diamonds out often many times in the pothole. So the little gems that will help us do better. And uh, my hope is that I can contribute to us learning the lessons that we need to learn from this experience. But more specifically, what happened over time to get us to this point culturally is that as more and more, it's a, it's a vicious cycle, as more and more character impaired people 
entered the society and uh, challenged character fostering institutions and traditions and seemed to prosper despite their poor character and rose to positions of power and influence. As all of that happened, then the norms, the standards, the institutions that helped foster character growth in all of us, those things eroded. Mm -hmm. And the more they eroded, the more character dysfunctional people were created. Mm -hmm. And it's a classic vicious cycle with character impaired people po populating the culture and then the culture erosion causing even more character dysfunction. Classic vicious cycle and it had to break and we're at the breaking point now well a few minutes ago george you <clears throat> you asked um kind of a, a, a hypothetical or even rhetorical question about you know wh wh where do things have to go before um you know people see that billboard you know in their face that uh, that things are that there's something they need to, to learn about and uh, realize about what's going on um and that can be um, like like you said, in a relationship, it it can be the um, the the rock bottom point, or or um, where things just totally fall apart. And you're and and you said that sometimes that you or that you've thought about a lot of the the possibilities, and they're you know some of them are quite dark. Um, well, that's one of the th oh, maybe it's it's just my dark mind, but I tend to I tend to look at the, the the dark ones too, right? And so I look at my study of history, you know, limited as it is, and look at um, other countries um, and what has happened there. And so what comes to mind for me is that, well, well, I try to think, well, what are the, what are some of the worst case scenarios? Well, if I look at like the, the Russian Revolution or a lot of what happened in, in Eastern Europe in the 20th century or in, you know, Mao in China, where the, the way I see what happened there is perhaps, I don't know enough about the, the history before then, you know, perhaps there were periods of time where something similar was going on um, in the sense of, of a corruption of, a corruption of, of character and previously held values and where things kind of fall apart. But then once things fall apart, once there's a, a revolutionary scenario, whether it's pr pr provoked by a world war or uh, some kind of natural disaster where, where things, you know, r just cross that tipping point to the point where there's too much to bear, then things actually get exponentially worse than they were in the lead up to it. Where beforehand you might have had all of this corruption in the system and you might have had the, the prevalence of, of, um, of like vast inequalities and character disturbance and narcissism and et cetera, et cetera. And then it's like, once that, once everything breaks down, then there's this branching that can happen. And I think you, you said something similar, right? Well, we can, you, you know, we can actually build something out of it. But the other option that happens is that, is that all of that evil, you could call it concentrates. And then you get, um, you know, um, a psychologist, Andrew Lobachevsky, you know, called it like a, a macrosocial psychopathological phenomenon where you get uh, this um, this network, this 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 rearranged social um, hierarchy where it is compared to what it was previously, it is living hell, right? And so that's that's where my mind goes as what's what's the worst case scenario? What might it take for people to see all this? Well, it might take the. <laughs> You know, as bad as things are at present, it might take something exponentially worse to the point where um, society is completely unrecognizable, and it's staring you in the face. And and at that point, there's there's not a lot you can do. Ah, but here's the here's the other side of that. Okay, you know, when we use this mind to ponder these big issues and what the heck we could possibly do to change things. It truly is mind boggling. It gives me a headache. There are no easy solutions. And besides which, we don't have that kind of power. Power we do have, however, is how each one of us meets the moment. Mm -hmm. And that's why character matters. 
And that's why I'll probably die speaking about it. Because like how do you need how do you eat an elephant? One morsel at a time. How do you change the world? Dr. Martin Luther King knew the answer to that. One heart at a time, starting with mine. That's where we have power. We have power not to alter the future, not to change the past, but we have the power in any encounter to meet that moment with a right heart. And this is what my epiphany was in therapy because you know we're all actually good potential therapists for each other the magic in therapy is how the moment ends up transforming that's the magic of therapy and if that moment doesn't transform the whole process has been pretty worthless you know, I have so many people who have reported to me experiencing what I now call in my workshops, therapy-induced trauma. They drug their character-impaired relationship partner in, finally browbeat them enough, and then they reluctantly say, all right, just to get you off my friggin' back, I'll go, you know. And then they end up in the therapist's office and they try this technique and that technique. Maybe even the character impaired person is so skilled in the art of positive impression management that they get the therapist thinking that the other person's the crazy one. Nothing good comes of the whole process. And so the person leaves even more dejected than they were. If the encounter doesn't transform and something's wrong with the encounter. And I firmly believe the wisdom of the sages when they say that only love, real love, not all of the hundreds of things that we call love, transforms. And it has to start with us. If I'm in an encounter in a, with another human being, say even in my office with someone who has narcissistic inclinations, if, I've, if I'm loving myself appropriately, some things are gonna be off the table. And if that person is going to have a prayer of learning to love better, some other things are gonna to have to be off the table. Now, how, how? I encourage a more loving, healthy response to occur in that moment that I have with you right here, right now in my office is everything and is potentially transforming. And it's something that each one of us can do every single time we encounter another human being on this planet. We have it within us to change the world, but it has to start with us. So it's, really it's, as, really... it's really as simple as that. Yeah. Yeah. Simple does not equate to easy. If loving were easy, everybody would do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's not easy. <laughs> and it masquerades as many other things. So I'd, I'd like to ask you something, George, because throughout the show, you've uh, repeated a couple of times that something compelled you to write Wolf in Sheep's Clothing. And you've alluded to how some of the books didn't have the spiritual component that you wanted them to have. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you had written the book, uh, The Judas Syndrome, which was um, intended to be read uh, mostly by Christians um, who might have some understanding or some uh, connection to faith in, in the higher, but could, uh, could perhaps learn to strengthen it. So, uh, I mean, this, this would seem to be a very 
important um, dimension to uh, to growth towards um, towards becoming more individuated, healthier, uh, and to in potential help others. So I I was hoping you could talk a little bit about your faith and where you think faith comes in with self-growth and development and healing and uh, that sort of uh, group of, of uh, issues. Yeah. Well, it's certainly more than religion for me. Way bigger than that. Uh, most conflicts in the world have been inspired by or promulgated by religious differences. So, you know, uh, the, the narcissism that I see in all organizational systems of belief is that if we could just get everybody to think like we do, then we could have peace, mm -hmm. right? Uh, how's that working for you? <laughs> how's that work for the human race? And that's why I'm even hesitant to apply a word to it, whatever that something was that compelled me. You know, uh, within the Jewish tradition, if you, or, and even within the Christian tradition, if you read Moses's inquiry to this something that he encountered in the burning bush, and when he asked for an identity, God supposedly said back to him, basically, none of your business. <laughs> I, I am that which I am. <laughs> you can't possibly wrap your little head around it. Well, yeah, and so go back and tell the Pharaoh that I am sent you, <laughs> for lack of anything better. Well, how's that for, for a name or an identity? You know, uh, we can be so arrogant. It's just part of our inherent makeup. And that's the paradox of life for me. The paradox of life is if we're actually meant for something better, why do we have to start out so primitively? Why are we wired the crazy way that we are if we're destined for something more? It's a paradox, isn't it? And I think all of the great systems of belief in the world have, have come to their own vain answers about why and how and how to get there. And, and you can find kernels of beautiful truth in every one of them. Mm -hmm. But I frankly think that the, the energy that I know is real is way bigger than any of those self-righteous conceptualizations. So even though I might uh, use some of the practices myself, and even though I find beauty in all of the interfaith uh, dialogue that I have with folks of other persuasions, I don't put my faith in any right ritual or practice. The something bigger that I believe in is bigger than all of that, too. Mm -hmm. That's just where I am. I hope that answers your question because <laughs> it's pretty vague. I know it's vague to me. Well, when you were saying that, I was thinking, okay, so it's kind of an agnostic inspiration that you. Uh, no, it's you know. not agnostic. Uh, I, I have to challenge that. I don't just believe that there's a bigger something, I know there is. Mm hmm. I mean, I know it because that bigger something just took a big fat two by four and whooped me upside the head and let me know that it's real. 
but I think it's vain to even attempt to define it. Mm -hmm. If you get it, and if you really understand the relationship, then you act like it. And that's how you know people who are enlightened versus those who aren't. They behave differently. And you, you can look at them all through history and they're not necessarily perfect people. We don't have to be without flaws. We just have to be connected to something bigger and pay attention. And when it kicks us, it pushes us to do something, it behooves us to listen. I'll give you another example. You know that I, uh, uh, I, I, I think I mentioned on the blog that I'd never actually composed a song before. I'm musical. The only instrument I've ever played has been my vo voice. But years ago, uh, through because of some surgeries and whatnot and some other neurological problems, I lost that. So I've never been much of a musician, but I've always loved music. And uh, in 1997, a, a melody started playing in my head. I had no idea where it came from. It just started playing over and over and over. And I thought, what the heck is this all about? And what's it for? I, I, I Part of me thought I might be going a little nuts. And uh, eventually, collaborating with my wife and my brother, I found some words for it. I, I only knew one phrase that was meant to be in there, and that was America, my home. And so this, this is the truth. I, I, I had no idea why we would record this song, why we would get some uh, musicians together and a vocalist and put this thing together because it was going to go nowhere, absolutely nowhere, except on a cassette tape that I would listen to in my truck at the time. <laughs> but I just had to do it. But the day after 9-11, the universe would show me what its purpose was. And it wasn't even a 9-11 song. So you just never know what's going to happen mm -hmm. or why. But you have to pay attention. And I, I sincerely believe that everybody, when they, when, they, when they stop using this and they uncover their, their deeper, uh, more authentic mind, um, has that voice talking to them in there. Hmm. And uh, the, the problem is we think too much with this <laughs> and don't listen too much to what's going on in here where the source resides. That just reminds me. Would, hey, I'm sorry? No, no, go ahead. Finish your thought. Uh, I, I, I'm really done. <laughs> okay. I was just going to say, just incidentally, that reminds me of... Um... Uh, I was just listening to an interview with Wim Hof. Have you heard of Wim Hof, the Iceman? No. He's a. No. Uh, oh, what country is he from? Is he from? Do you remember? Is he like? Is it Scandinavian or or Dutch or something? Well, mm -hmm. he's he's not American, but uh, <laughs> but he's uh, he's famous for uh, for years. He he did um, like cold adaptation. Like he'd he'd swim in ice cold water every day, and uh -huh. and he's become um, he's become. Uh, quite popular, quite well known for the, for this because that's led him to some remarkable um, abilities. Like you know, he can hold his breath for a long time underwater in freezing cold water. Swim, you know, he swims under under the ice in the in the Arctic, and um, he he has a, a remarkable control over his own body and his own um, like uh, physiological processes. He at one uh, at one point, I think six years ago, he he um, he had a doctor. He kind of participated in, ex in an experiment and injected, got got E. coli injected into him and and showed no immune response. And uh, so basically has, he, he's basically 
gotten a, a great deal of control over his over his body, and it and it has resulted in some some amazing things. And so uh, I was listening to an, an interview with him that was just done in November, and uh, it was with Jordan Peterson who asked him. Um, well, how did this start? Like, where, where did you first get the ins- inspiration for, for going into the cold? And he says, oh, it was just a gut feeling, you know, and, mm-hmm. and that, that was it. He just knew yep. that he had, he had to go in the cold. And so, um, he just made, made the same point you do that, that we're, we're, um, we're so cut off from that, that voice that speaks to us that, um, <clears throat> that isn't the, you know, what you, what you think it's not, you it's not a, it's not a thought process as we normally think of a, of a thought process. There is some some kind of um uh, well com- i don't even know what to call it com- communication um some kind of yeah something that that, com- that can communicate with our mind that's 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 greater than our mind and uh more insightful than our than our mind is and well maybe the the source of of the inspiration like the inspiration for that melody or the it might be the inspiration for for a choice that that has to be made a decision that has to be to be made that that you don't know and and that that might present itself as you know this path not that path and you want yeah. you might not even know why why but it shows up right. and it's so strong right and i think one of the obstacles to that is you know we've had a lot of folks in vanity uh attempting to define who or what god is mm-hmm. when very few of us even understand who we are Mm-hmm. And uh, that's where I think it has to start. I, 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 that's where I think it really has to start. And uh, I think really that's what's mostly driven my work is that inspiration, wherever it's come from. Uh, back in early workshop days, I, I uh, found myself just uttering the phrase, if we don't get honest with ourselves, about ourselves, and with each other, about each other, we're, we're going to have a hard time making it. Mm-hmm. So the real question is to get to know ourselves, what we're really all about, what makes us tick. Because when we know ourselves, then we'll actually know our brothers and sisters a hell of a lot better. Mm-hmm. And uh, then we have half a chance. Well, that reminds me of, um, are you still good for time, George? I am. Uh, okay. I, I can't believe that I, I, I usually have all modes <laughs> of people trying to get a hold of me uh, blocked uh, for these things. And somehow <laughs> people are finding a way to sneak through. <laughs> but, but that's all right. I've yeah. got these automatic <laughs> little reminders that tell them I'm busy. Sorry. Great. Um <laughs> I just on what you just said. I want to come back for just a bit to to the new book that you're working on, because um, mm-hmm. you you very very um, handily provided the page number for uh, for the inspiration for that book here. So I wanted to read some of the Ten Commandments of Character, just so our uh, you know viewers and listeners get a chance, and then maybe you could talk a bit about one of them, or maybe. If you if if anyone sticks out of what I say, we could uh, focus on it because sure. they're really good. And by uh, the way, a little disclaimer: yeah. I have already rewritten them a little okay. bit more eloquently. But right. yes, well, so here they are in their original form, uh, in their okay. in their unpolished state. So you are not the center of the universe. I'm just going to read the short versions. Remember, you are not entitled to anything. You are neither an insignificant speck nor are you so precious or essential to the universe that it simply cannot do without you. To know, pursue, speak, and display the truth to the best of your ability, have the utmost reverence for the truth. Be the master of your appetites and dislikes. Be the master of your impulses. Perseverance, patience, and endurance are not really virtues in themselves. Neither your tendency to anger nor your instinct to aggress is inherently evil although wrath is a deadly sin. And two more, treat others with civility and generosity, and to the best of your ability, have sincerity of heart and purpose. Yeah, I might say with regard to that last one, I've also uh, really had to reckon with the fact that sincerity itself is also not enough. 
Uh, you can read several texts and several religions talking about the necessity for purity of heart also. Uh, there are some folks who are very sincere, in other words, without pretense, yeah. who are who they are without any question. <laughs> no, no, no phoniness that, and, and, and frankly, no shame. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's not necessarily a good thing either. Mm -hmm. So it's not enough to be just sincere. Mm -hmm. uh, it's important to be both sincere and clean or pure of heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, those... So um, which ahead. one would you like to talk about? Because <laughs> well, we well, can talk about all of them yeah. uh, at length. <laughs> well, maybe... Well, I had a question yeah, regarding that. So um, embracing for the journey, uh, embracing and living the Ten Commandments of Character, the book that you're working on. Yeah, you, Essentials for the Journey, yes. Yes. So... so what do you what feature of of uh of what you write there george would you say drove you to expand on on these thoughts where, where did you 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 wanted it to have the spiritual component and and uh to to have an added eloquence and what well let me ask you this way um what are you most proud of or what do you think was the the accomplishment um, what, what did you set out to accomplish and what do you think, uh, is its core value to, to people who know your work or, or who want to grow? Okay. So let me answer both of those questions the same way. Uh, because you were asking me about, uh, what, what happened to kind of change my perspective and wanted to, where I needed to add this additional dimension. And uh, you also asked me what I was proudest of. So the answer to each one of those questions is actually the same. I used to be proudest of the fact that I had discovered something important and had put it out there and receive some recognition for it. And that's pretty darn vain. These days, I'm most proud of having listened and followed. And that makes all the difference. And that's why I'm rewriting this book because I've always been kind of a decent guy as far as, you know, like behaving myself, being a, you know, being good. It's not enough. It's not enough. And until we connect up with something bigger, and put ourselves at its service, life is pretty empty. It's full of momentary pleasures and addictions and a hell of a lot of pain, but it's not living. And because we have so many temporary pleasures and so many ways to get addicted, And so many ways to pretend like we're really connected, you know, on these things, te te texting in and back and forth, and, you know. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. And we barely even know our neighbors, usually. That's what's happened to us. Yeah. So... Did I invent that? Hell no. You know, I, like I said, I, sometimes I have to, I'm kind of a stubborn guy actually in many respects. So whatever that something is out there many times has to wake me up with a pretty good shake. So these days I'm most, uh, and proud is not even the word, I'm most 
okay with myself for having listened and maybe being a conduit for something. Great. Oh, I think we were frozen on us, George. Did we lose you? Can you hear us? Oh, there we go. We lost the internet there for a oh. minute. I'm not sure what happened. <laughs> well, it it ended right the the internet went out right after you'd finished your thoughts so we didn't lose any of that oh good. okay good good and it, and it was such a wonderful thought that that yeah you, stood you still you, <laughs> for us you, uh, I, I know i blew up the internet you blew up you blew up the internet with the the depth of the thought that you just shared church <laughs> one was, of those synchronicities huh? yeah. <laughs> no it, it was heard and felt uh on, on our end, I think, and um, appreciated very much. Mm -hmm. No, and that's, I mean, all I can say is is that I agree with that that approach and that that look at life um, completely. Is that 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 is the thing that that matters the most, and and all the all kind of other accomplishments don't really amount to much if it's if you're following your call and doing what you're here to do. That's the thing that gives the the most um, not only satisfaction with life, but the, you know the the feeling that you're actually doing what you're here to do. You know, fulfilling a purpose, as opposed to a, getting something for yourself, right? Yeah. Let me give you a concrete example of that that I can think of. I have a friend who I know who has always wanted to play the big stage, but. For most of his life, he's played the small stage. I think, in part, in large measure, because he hasn't figured out why. When you're willing to put everything on the line, sacrifice everything, for what you feel called to put into the world, you don't do it to occupy the stage. You do it because something bigger is calling you to do it. And if you're meant to be on the big stage, you will be. If, if, you're, if the message is meant to be heard by a lot of people, it will be. But the important thing is to really follow the call. Sometimes it takes people a lifetime to figure that out. The other thing about it is that the things that all the mystics throughout all the ages have been trying to tell us about the bigger realities of life are just too damn good to be true. They want to open us up to a richness of life and its purpose and its destiny that is way beyond our ability to comprehend or appreciate. And the world sets a very, very different standard for us. It tells us basically that we got to get what we can get and enjoy what we can enjoy and do it fast because tomorrow we could die. You know? So grab as much as you can and, and, and acquire as much power and money as you can. And this is what we're taught from very early on. Jeez. <laughs> is it a surprise <laughs> we're in this mess? <laughs> yeah. and mean, meanwhile, so. we, meanwhile, we can't even, well, my response to the bit about the mystics, it also applies to the bit about life and and society is that meanwhile we can't even get along with our siblings you know literally and right. figuratively right. it's like there's there's a place you've got to start right that we're we're in such a such a low place character wise that we've got to do a lot of work to even approach the level of um um you know starting with the contemplation of the of the mysteries right so uh, again to get back to that question asked before what the universe was speaking to me in the rewrite of this book 
I, I could just hear the universe telling me, George, it's not just about being good. You want to tell anybody about character, first of all, start with yourself and realize that there were things about you and your lack of appreciation for the inherent interconnectedness, the inherent interconnectedness of us all and the way that you were meeting every moment that were very, very lacking. And so it wasn't enough for you to be just a good guy. The manner in which you were meeting each moment with every person really needed a lot more attention. And boy, that spoke to me. And as I advise in all my workshops, you know, you got to act your way into a new way of thinking, not vice versa. So when I started very deliberately, to the best of my ability, trying to meet those encounters with everybody I met in a very different way, holy moly, what an epiphany. It was just amazing to see what different could one difference could come out of the encounter. Hmm. Well, George, did you did you have something that you wanted to finish on that thought? No, no, because um, that... well, pr pr probably, but probably my mind would take uh, off in a million more <laughs> tangents and. <laughs> because, because that well that that led me to a, a tangent that I wanted to ask you about. It was. Um, I can't, something earlier in the in an earlier part of the interview made me think of it. Um, no, no, it was the part you just repeated about um, those. The reason that treatments for a lot of people with uh, some kind of character impairment doesn't work is because it's basically using the wrong methods. And, and you laid out your method. That reminded me of um, a book that you cite in Character Disturbance, I believe, um, Inside the Criminal Mind mm -hmm. by. Um, What's his name? I, I don't know how to pronounce it. Stanton Samenow? Yeah. Sam Samenow. Yes. That's right. Yes. Um, and in the at the end of that book, I believe in the last chapter, he, he takes uh, takes you through one of his kind of success stories, which you couldn't call a grand success, but it was a success in the sense that here was a deeply like, um, well, uh, a criminal a criminal mind, like a, a bad dude, basically, who'd done a lot of bad things. And right. who who through through this process through interacting with Samano and or or was it Samano's professor um, I can't remember the guy that taught him that he worked with um, took him through this process where he could actually live a, like a functioning life not of right. crime. I and, think you're speaking of Urban Jakobson who he yes. wrote his first book with. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Yeah, that's correct. Um, and so I just wanted to know if that if if you see any similarities with what you do, because, um, because like we said earlier, there are some people that seem like, um, that seem like they're so far gone or so, so disturbed, maybe, uh, maybe like, um, um, maybe some, some psychopathy, like some hardcore psychopathy, like at the top of the, the hair checklist that maybe there's, maybe there's nothing you can do for some people, but what, but how do you, s maybe just, I, I want to know how that works out, how, I want to maybe you could give a really short like case study of of what you see change um and and how you do it. I know that's a huge topic but yeah, it really is. It's it's another uh visit, but let let me uh speak to one core issue uh that's really important uh that's come out of my not just out of my individual work but also has begun to be supported by research. You know, back in the late 60s and early 70s and 80s, there were all these pop psychology books about the um, about the uh, toxicity of shame. Mm. And if you read any of those books uh, uh, and you adopted their their axioms, it, it, it was okay to feel guilty about something. It was okay to feel not good about an act that you had done, but it was never helpful to feel badly about the person you were. And so 
even therapists were actually instructed in this. Mm -hmm. Don't deal with people on their character. Talk about their behavior only and what needs to change in their behavior. But don't cast any aspersions. Don't make any value statements. Don't make any judgments because otherwise you'll invite them to feel badly about themselves. And that's never any good. Well, we have witnessed what shamelessness looks like. And believe me, it ain't pretty. Mm -hmm. So what I've come to find in my work with even the most severely disturbed characters who found somehow the resources to be better is that not one of those persons ever changed out of a feeling of guilt. I know some abusers who actually felt awful every single time they lost it and beat the crap out of their partner. But you know what? It didn't change them. It didn't stop them from doing it again. The only thing that made a difference for any of the people who have actually managed to turn their lives around in some way meaningfully was when they took that look in the mirror and they said to themselves, you know, I don't like you anymore. The way you think, the attitudes you hold, the way you treat people, the way you even think of yourself, the person you want to be or present to the world, not pretty. Mm -hmm. Only shame, healthy shame, saved them. We now know what shamelessness looks like. It's not pretty. Now, does that mean that some people who bear toxic, unreasonable shame that was never deserved shouldn't be rid of it? No, that, that doesn't mean that at all. I, we, people who bear on unrealistic, horrendous shame for things that were never their fault need to be rid of that. But shamelessness is not a good thing either. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that far more people have been inspired to meaningful change, not so much as a result of the things that they have done, but because of the kind of person that they knew that they, they, that, that behavior reflected that they were. And when somebody come, becomes uncomfortable with that, things really begin to change. Hmm. Things really begin to change. So, George, in, in one of your essays on your website called Self-Awakening in Times of Darkness, you write, mm -hmm. Self-Awakening generally happens in one of two ways. The first way is much less common. It occurs when a person is so totally swept away by great love and joy that they lose all sense of their smaller, wounded, guarded, well-defended, quote, false self. Inhibitions yep. melt away, and they experience sublime ecstasy. But more commonly, it happens when circumstances deal such a fate blow that all one's learned ways of coping fail. This is an extraordinarily painful process, and some don't survive it. But those who do, even in the midst of their pain, find the light within. And that's when real living truly begins for them. Yeah. On the show, we've talked a little bit about uh, something called positive disintegration, uh, the work of uh, Kazimir Dubrowski, a psychologist, who this was kind of his account, I think, of, of what you're right. saying here, right. where you know, coming to a better place necessarily sometimes is very painful. Right. And some don't come out through the other side, but then there is the possibility that if one can endure this process and, right. and engage it, that there's a possibility of li living an even richer, deeper, uh, more joyous, that you're making space for a greater amount of joy and, and positive experience, I think. Would you say that's correct? Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Yes. Couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> yeah. And it, and it does sound compliment. like saying, and it does sound like he's saying the exact same thing, just in a different way. Yeah. 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 And actually I, I was thumbing through the book, um, character disturbance, because it had been, you know, some years since I read it. I read it when it came out. Um, when was that? 2011. So 10 years ago now. And there was this picture, the, the neurosis one. Uh, yes. Uh, so it will. A so diagram? It was, mm-hmm. Yeah, it was, uh, it was blurry. So it just, it's basically an arrow between neurosis and self-actualization, altruism. But then there's another arrow to character disturbance. And character disturbance is on the same end of the spectrum, or the same side of the spectrum as self-actualization and altruism. And, ner- and neurosis is on the opposite side. And that immediately reminded me of... Dabrowski, because um, just really shortly, the positive disintegration is his idea that there's that there is a a, a primitive dis, uh, a primitive integration of personality, which must which must and does disintegrate in various forms through various neuroses, and um, or um, and then that dis, that dis, that um, disintegration can be what he calls positive or negative. Negative would be suicide, psychosis. Um, Basically, a you know a total destruction in some way or another, and then a positive disintegration is an, a reintegration on a higher level, and the highest level you know would be something like what you write, like a an an altruism, um, a self self actualized in some way. Um, he calls it secondary integration, and it's that it's that neurosis, it's that um, disintegration, which is the the primary means by which that happens. That that old it, that old integration has to be broken down and it has to fall apart in order to to reintegrate on that higher level, and so when so um, so when you have a, a personality structure a, a person who who never feels that like organic shame um, of of what they've done and, and even who they are if there's something that really is shame worthy about it then they'll they'll just remain that that integrated personality and. Not, and and even if and like the like the guy that you did or the not necessarily the guy but the partner you described who 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 feels bad every time who really feels guilty every time they lose themselves and and beat their partner it they they keep um, just rebounding back to that personality structure it's like uh, that would be in Dabrowski's terms a disintegration and then a, then right after that a reintegration at the same level a reintegration at the same level it's it doesn't go anywhere. But for that, that structure has to, in a sense, globally break down um, in order to, to recreate itself at a higher level. So, um, yeah, I, I think there's a lot to that, that that that, 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 that process is so, is so important. And that's why it's such a shame, you know, no pun intended, that, that the, 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 the mental health community totally dropped the ball, you know, so many, the, yeah. all those years ago to... Uh, to, yeah. what was another word for it? The, the um, self-esteem movement. Yeah. The self-esteem movement. It's like, well, you just have yeah. to feel good about yourself, even if you're a crappy person, you know? Right. Exactly. Uh, you know, uh, and that's one of the commandments that I address in the new book about keeping that balanced sense of self-worth. Very few folks come to a point where they actually know where their worth comes from and what it really is. And so we, we have these inflations that take on a narcissistic character. Uh, and speaking of that, in the time that remains here, I, we're getting very short here. Yes. But, uh, I wanted to say that uh, another unfortunate aspect of our times is that information about narcissism is out there everywhere. There's an expert around every corner. Uh, and the fact is that character disturbance is a spectrum phenomenon and narcissism itself is a spectrum phenomenon. There are many, many different expressions of it, uh, and they're not the same. Their underlying dynamics are not the same. And so there, there are only a few general principles and rules, and it saddens me that there's so much misinformation uh, out there. Um, but there is a lot of it, and there's even some self-described psychopaths, malignant narcissists out there Mm -hmm. telling people essentially this, I'm a person who can't care. 
Therefore, I don't care about you. My purpose in life is to manipulate you and exploit you without any care or compunction. And by the way, I have all the answers in this book that you need for your life. No. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, how anybody even entertains on the surface something as ridiculous as that, I don't know. But um, <laughs> That kind of stuff is out there. I'm not mentioning any names, but there I can think of two folks right right off the bat. Mm -hmm. um, so there's just there's a lot out there, but there's also a lot of, of misinformation. And besides which, many times the pain in people's life is not aided by this information. It's only compounded. You know, folks in toxic relationships have this inherent uh, cognitive dissonance, and they really want to understand what's going on, but sometimes the understanding is in itself a burden. Uh, what we really need to do to uh, rest ourselves free uh, is to carve a different path. Uh, all the understanding in the world won't necessarily get us there. It's the walk that gets us there. It's putting one foot in front of the other and taking a different course than we've been used to taking and experiencing the beautiful results of that. Um, so um, I, th I just thought, uh, that I always feel compelled whenever I give an interview to point to the fact that there's a whole lot out there, but not a lot that will ultimately meaningfully help change a person's life. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's another reason why I labor so long and hard on these uh, these things that I put out there. But what, one of the four agreements that uh, Louise talks about is uh, being impeccable with your words. And, you know, making sure that you're choosing them very carefully and that they really reflect something honest and true and bigger than you. <laughs> that they're not just words. Mm -hmm. that sound really wonderful and make you sound great. I remember the very first time that I listened to uh, uh, one famous radio commentator, I'm not mentioning his name, uh, describing the purpose of certain elements of his program. And, and he flatly stated to the audience, the purpose is to make me look good because I'm here to sell myself. That's why you're turning, tuning in. So the purpose is all about me and me looking great and getting you to follow me and getting you to t tell your friends to do the same. That's the purpose. Uh, wow. And that can be the purpose. And if it is the purpose, it only helps perpetuate the problem. Mm -hmm. So we have to try to make it not the purpose. Right. Have to try to make it something about something well bigger and more important than that. Absolutely, George. We know you're running out of time. You've got an engagement coming up really quick. Um, so, well, on that, we're just going to have to wait for your next book to come out. Uh, we hope it's soon. And we what, wanna... what a pleasant interview. Oh, it's it's been great. Yeah, it's been fun. I've had a great Wonderful. time. Wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Well, when the new book when the new book comes out, you know, let us know and we'll. We'll have you on I to talk about it. I definitely will. Okay. And uh, would love to have another conversation sometime. There's Great. Tons of stuff we haven't covered. But. Yeah, a lot. I wanted to I wanted to talk a bit about psychopathy. I mean, I just mentioned it once. We didn't even get into it. So <laughs> we'll, yeah. we'll talk We'll talk again. But uh, okay. thanks again so much and take care Thank and good luck. Thank you. Great to meet you. All right. You too. Thank you. Bye, George. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye.